So last but definitely not least, we have uh, Gina Saison with uh, the Louisiana Oil Spill Coordinator's Office. Uh, Gina, all right, so Gina's fun fact is that she has over 2,000 hours volunteering as an aquarist at the Aquarium of the Americas in New Orleans. That's true. Forgot I gave you that one. <laughs> Thank you. So Emily uh, called a few weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, and said, uh, is there anything missing from this agenda? And there was an open spot, and I said, yeah. I gave her quickly uh, several species to maybe think about, and I started looking for speakers that could maybe speak to those topics and started putting feelers out. Nobody bit. And so then she said, well, I really want you to do it. And I'm like, oh, the lineup is pretty tough and I can't compete with that. So none of this is my research. Uh, it wouldn't have happened at all, uh, but for Matt, Matthew Morschbacher with our office. So uh, I want to thank him for pulling all the literature together. Um, my normal activities are um, oil spill response, NERDA, and lots of coordination of uh, trustees and agencies during a spill. So uh, what I do have is experience out there. I think James Harris said it earlier, the locals have the majority of the knowledge, right? They know about those things. Well, I consider myself kind of a local of Marsh, South Louisiana, and even inland. I'm getting more and more familiar with inland Louisiana, just being out there, knowing what I'm looking at and seeing how what things are happening during an oil spill. So that's where my knowledge base comes from, experience. Underdog, I was happy to see Kayla had that in her presentation earlier. That's the era that I came from around the 70s, uh, 80s. So his slogan was, uh, have no fear, underdog is here, right? So bioindicators, I'm not going to read these slides because you guys can read it. They'll be online, so it shouldn't, uh, you, sh you could go back and look at it. But we've talked about bioindicators multiple times today. Um, they, they tell us about the environment, what could be happening out there, um, their attributes, their distributions, uh, known biology, um, ability to provide that early alert, things like that. Um, so sentinel species along those same lines, uh, reliable ones are common, easily handled, and uh, consistently measured responses. Examples, you know, everybody knows about the canary in the coal mine. That could be a little hero, you know, he's gonna fly into that coal mine, save human lives, uh, but sacrifice the bird itself. It doesn't fly back out, it's too dangerous to go in. So the underdogs of Louisiana's bays and estuaries, among all the things we talked about today, um, I think mycid shrimp, grass, grass shrimp, mussels, and marshmallows are some of those things that are also overlooked, um, not typically studied, so. First few slides are just gonna be the biology of each one and then maybe some of the literature that exists on these things. So uh, mycids, my background, um, kind of first out of college, I uh, always wanted to be the next Jacques Cousteau, right? Uh, I wanted to go and, and scuba dive and all those things. Well, I ended up culturing fish and shrimp uh, to go into tox tests. And it kind of broke my heart because I was rearing these beautiful little fish to go be killed in toxicity tests. So it was kind of um, a, a dilemma for me, but I would count mycids my whole life. <laughs> for about three years, I did that. And you can, when you feed them, you can, uh, we fed them brine shrimp, not fly. And so you could watch the brine shrimp, the colored brine shrimp, red brine shrimp, going through their clear little bodies. And I just thought it was so fascinating looking at them under um, uh, dissecting microscopes. They're small crustaceans, they're abundant, usually in less than six feet of water. Uh, they're omnivores, they graze on all the epiphytes that are on the marsh plants and, and uh, on the oyster beds and things like that. They're easily cultured, but somewhat sensitive. Uh, and they're used in EPA toxicity tests for effluent waters all the time. Uh, drilling mud tests, things like that. So um, we have lots of good LC50 data, uh, dose response curves on effluents, uh, and most of those have PAHs in them. So we have some good information, but no 
Louisiana specific field studies on mycids that I'm aware of. Um, some of the effects, you know, say that uh, because they're clear body organisms, if they're exposed to pHs, especially chronically, uh, the, the pHs are absorbed into their tissues and um, the ultraviolet light in the shallow water, the penetration of the UV um, ca actually causes more harm than just the pHs in and of itself. Uh, another factor is uh, UV, I'm sorry, um, weathered oil here, this statement, weathered oil will uh, substantially increase toxicity. And that's something that I found very interesting because a lot, deep water was weathered as it came in. A lot of the spills that we see, people uh, say, well, you know, that's just sheen, it's weathered oil, it's not a big deal. Well, you know, effects of weathering. So um, certain pHs are phototoxic. Severe tissue damage, you know, this is just some of the literature that uh, supports that mycids are affected by PAHs. Grass shrimp are the same way. Clear bodied, small crustaceans, a little bit larger, they actually feed on the mycid shrimp. Um, they're detritivores, so secondary consumers. Um, they break down that organic material, uh, just like the, um, the snails do. They start breaking down the plants and, and the um, epiphytes and they're attracted and live on those uh, plant stems and oyster reefs. They're a key li link in the food chain. That's a gravid female with her eggs, um, and they're a huge support of fishery stocks. Inst instrumental in that transport of energy. Um, Again, we have lots of um, literature out there because grass shrimp have been used in tox tests and uh, really good information about the narcotic effects uh, on shrimp um, from PAHs. So naphthalenes are one of the components that when it's in the water and it's uh, fresh, those, um, they, it causes almost like a drunken effect. And so they're disoriented, um, or disoriented swimming and and motions, and you can imagine if they're not able to jump away quickly from something, they're gonna uh, get eaten faster, potentially. Lots of detrimental effects on har uh, hatching larvae. So the juvenile stages of these invertebrates are even more susceptible than sometimes the adults. Chronic exposure, again, that's a reoccurring theme. Chronic exposure is usually uh, more of a problem than acute. So over time, when these oil spills sit there, over time, rib mussels. Um, you see these in the marsh. F folks uh, tend to walk over them, uh, especially when there's high water. You don't see them readily, uh, but they're there. Uh, intertidal filter feeders, so they clean up the edge, right? Um, they're there all the time, and they're, um, they're basal threads. Uh, if you ever tried to pull one out of the marsh, they're intertwined with the Spartina grass and they're extremely hard to get out and uh, they support that um, first wall structure of the marsh. So that edge and they're, they're there to provide that um, support and help the plants stay in place, keep the sediments there and uh, provide that, um, that structural integrity. Uh, they deposit fecal matter on the surrounding sediments, stimulates the grass growth um, they increase marsh net productivity and stability, as I said. Um, very few studies in the Mississippi Deltaic region. So we have lots of studies on other ribbed mussels in the Atlantic region, but not a whole lot of literature here. Uh, muscle, uh, NOAA's Muscle Watch program has a lot of good information that we could tap into and use for our literature base in oil spills. This is what they look like at the base of the plant. This is an actual, actually in an oiled area. They're just embedded in there. Most people walk over them. They don't know they're there. So this is rib muscles in um, toxicity tests. Uh, so some of the literature, or not toxicity tests, but in research. And some of the literature um, tells how, how important they are. Uh, estuarine filtration, soil strengthening, 
So changes, if you lose the bivalves, you may start losing that structure, that edge, maybe even some of the plants. Uh, oil does cause, uh, in some cases, decreased growth rates, uh, lower feeding rates, things like that. Marshmallows. So two types here, um, the sheep's head minnow and um, golf killifish, but this is the sheep's head minnow. Gulf killifish, male and female. They're small, they live in our fresh brackish saline marshes. They're here all the time. They're omnivores, so they live off the epiphytes on the plants and the oyster beds, uh, on the seagrass beds. Um, they eat the small crustaceans, so the grass shrimp and the, the um, mice and shrimp. Uh, they spawn in spring and fall. The eggs stick to everything, the plant stems themselves, uh, the oyster beds. So if you can imagine an oil spill occurring, uh, the minnows laying their eggs on the plant stems and, um, and then the oil coming in and affecting those, those embryos developing. So they're a very important prey for fishing birds and I think uh, the last talk really highlighted that. Um, maybe not the only thing, but an important part of it. Uh, they're a popular live bait. They have very small scale movement, so they don't go very far. There's not a huge home range there. Um, their sister uh, species um, is studied pretty extensively. There's a lot of literature on other species, not a whole lot on this species in Louisiana, these two species in Louisiana. So this statement uh, could become the marine science equivalent of the white mouse used in medical research. So lots of ideas here. So pHs, you know, cause a lot of the same effects in, in the other things that we saw, uh, maybe even more. So I think I've, I've seen literature that supports that there's genomic effects that may be hard coded into their, their um, uh, DNA. And so the changes that are, that are occurring through PAH exposure may be transferable uh, in their DNA. So it's just something to think about. Uh, Whitehead and uh, Fernando Galvez had um, lots of good data on gill histology. So CYP1A causing lots of changes in the gill structure. Um, cardiovascular defects, um, delayed hatching, reduced hatching, all these things. So this is where I come in. I'm out there all the time, I'm seeing oil spills, and I know I'm on the periphery of the literature and know some of what's occurring in, in the research labs. Uh, but when we see this, this is oil, fresh product at the shoreline, uh, coming out of a well, uh, you know, hitting the shoreline as the tide rises, this oil that's here is gonna be pushed back into the marsh. And this is where everything is. All the things we talked about just now live at this edge and throughout the marsh. So this is a spill similar to that uh, first picture where you had fresh oil. This is a little bit uh, further in time, maybe about two, three weeks away. And we typically can still see this uh, oil band here. So if you were to go up and touch that with a gloved hand, still a little sticky tacky, uh, maybe not, um, you know, uh, still washing off, it off in the surf. So not free product, but still sticky tacky and transferable to organisms. Uh, and then right above that brown line, you can actually see the vegetation's chlorotic band. So it's being affected by that oil still. Maybe a few months later or up to a year later, sometimes that oil will actually cause this, which is dieback. Um, I really enjoyed Scott's presentation where he said he planted, so that gives us some good ideas about what we might be able to do in areas like this. Uh, but when you get really close, and you know, this is a monitoring pool here where we've put a quadrat out. Um, and this is what you see when you get close to it. Uh, that's actually footprints, which is not a good idea to get out of the, uh, the boat and trample, or trample oil into the marsh or into the rootstock. We learned that from the work that Scott did in that cleanup area, the treated areas. 
um, that it's better to stay off that marsh, but to monitor it, to collect data, to help support NRDA and other things, we actually need to collect this. So this is, you know, information that we record and, and make note of if, it, if it's still out there months or years later. Um, when you have that level of oil and in the sediments, you're going to typically see the die off of the mussels or even in the earlier days of the spill, the raccoons and the predators will come in and because um, the mussels have been closed for some time, not able to feed, their basal, basal threads are not as intact, the soil structure's not there to hold them, maybe even the plant rootstock is dying off and they can easily pull out those mussels and uh, open up and eat what's left. Again, a secondary contamination issue potentially. Um, and this is what they look like uh, once, you, when, once you collect them. That's how you can tell they've been broken up by a predator, probably a raccoon or something, uh, a mink or an um, otter, sorry. And this is all the literature that uh, we have access to and Matt looked at to put some of this together. Uh, and it's, I mean, look at it, it goes on for days, but not a whole lot in Louisiana. And so underdogs are heroes. Can they be our heroes? Uh, you know, after one of the talks, I think it's, uh, it's nice to hear everyone's perspective because, you know, I'm panicked when I look at some of this stuff, but it, it, it's a nice perspective to know and it's reasonable to understand that Louisiana is resilient. We've had oil and gas production for over 100 years, and um, we still have, you know, beautiful marshes out there that are supporting a, a wide ecosystem of, um, you know, fish, birds, invertebrates. So uh, it gives me a little bit of a calming effect to hear some of everybody's perspectives. So um, similar species are well documented in other areas, uh, not as much here in Louisiana. Uh, some species are, are well documented for other pollutants besides PAHs and oil. Um, but, you know, Louisiana specific research, I think uh, I'm a scientist at heart, so I always want to know more uh, what's happening out there and, and, you know, how what I do on a daily basis affects these animals. Um, and then the environmental impacts. Linda mentioned the. Um, the hurricanes, we have systems that come through all the time. We have oil out there, we have extreme temperatures, anybody that's been in the marsh in the summertime, uh, a wide range of salinities, we got the freshwater diversions happening, all that. So what are those other environmental factors doing to oil exposed animals? You know, a cascading effect. Um, and then there's always spills of opportunity. There's, uh, Louisiana has, between 1,500 to 2,000 notifications of oil releases each year. Um, LOSCO is on scene for about 200 of those. Out of the 200, there's a very small number that actually move forward to a natural resource damage assessment. So there's always oil, uh, you know, in Louisiana that's being uh, released to the environment that we might be able to capitalize on and study. So just think about that and, um, you know, continue to research, folks. Thank you for that. Uh, I do have one anecdotal story uh, real quick. Um, at the um, toxicity lab where I used to work, you know, again, it was a, against my better judgment to um, kill these animals that I raised, right? They were my babies. I didn't want to see them die. Occasionally, we had to put them in uh, tests, control type tests to make sure the animals uh, were healthy. We had a healthy stock of them. And so uh, we didn't have to kill those and weigh them out for the EPA tests. So I would take them after the test was over and they survived and I would, they were exposed to VAHs, but I would put them in tanks and, and rear them up. I, I didn't want to kill them. So uh, I would watch how they were affected and this is not a scientific study. I did it on my own time, took care of the tanks and, and fed them on my own time. But uh, they actually grew up and I saw a lot of the effects that um, we see with the Deepwater Horizon uh, research that was done. You know, you had uh, the fathead minnows and um, saprinodons that had the curved spines and in the wild. I'm not sure they always had erratic 
swimming behaviors and sometimes would have to be encouraged to eat. And so I think, uh, you know, I was aware of all these things long before uh, I became an oil spill biologist. Um, but I believe in them and I appreciate everybody's uh, interest in them and I appreciate Sea Grant for um, putting these things on because I think James was right earlier. Uh, this is how we get the message out. The stuff that I'm seeing in the field, the stuff you're doing in the lab, uh, you know, getting it, communicating, getting it out there and so everybody's aware. Thank you.